Good afternoon and welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Joining us at the market site in Times Square, we have Peter Vahansky. He's the Vice President of Data Art. We are going to focus on open banking. Peter, as always, thank you so much for joining us at the market site. Now, open banking, that is a newer concept for the Trade Talks audience. Tell us more about that. Sure, so uh, let's talk about it on a couple of levels. As a concept, open banking is this idea that banks should operate more like platforms that allow third parties to build and offer product services functionality on top of what the bank itself offers. Um, we hear about unbundling of banking, unbundling of financial services. So banks are reimagining themselves as sets of distinct and interconnected capabilities. Think of Lego bricks, right? And so open banking is the idea that you open your Lego bricks to third parties and those other people can take some of their bricks and some of your bricks and build new and exciting things and offer those things to your customers. Um, Specifically in the UK, Open Banking, capital O, capital B, is a program that went live last year, about a year ago, uh, January 2018. It's a program that's mandated by the government and, and uh, administered by the regulators and paid for by the banks. The nine leading banks in the market that cover about 90% of the market uh, in, in the UK are participating in that program. And for consumers, it means that basically you as a, cu as a customer of a bank now have, should have the ability to give permission to a third party to access your financial data, specifically your account balances and your transaction history. And you could also instruct that trusted third party, approved third party, mm -hmm. to send a payment from your account. So that's open banking in the UK. Are you seeing mass adoption with that yet? So the UK situation is driven by um, regulators. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a broader regula regulation that's EU-wide, that's called PSD2, Payment Services Directive 2, that's coming later in 2019. Um, and so UK sort of preempted that, and they're now the first country in the world that has uh, a single standard nationally mandated uh, to implement open banking. The adoption has not been overwhelming, but that's okay, and let's talk about that for a second. So uh, there are a lot of fears that have to do with security, and then although security con uh, concerns are always valid, this is technology and things could happen, there's many, many reasons to be much less worried than people have been, um, especially based on the media coverage. And media has basically been playing up the contentious rather than the factual side of the story, and uh, there's a tiny bit of fear mongering yeah, going when on. You hear if I'm third allowed to party, say. that's the first thing you third think party, of. Or you'll be hacked. As soon as you mm -hmm. say the word hacked, everybody is worried. But uh, what we have to understand about uh, security of financial transactions is two things. One, uh, managing API risk, as in giving programmatic access through an application programming interface to, uh, say, for example, a bank, is a very well understood area and it's very well done elsewhere in the world, and open banking will, will be no different. So we need better PR. It's basically one of the lessons learned is you need better PR for, for financial technology. And the other is there's far easier methods to scam and defraud people. And it's kind of like if you and I are running away from a bear, you don't have to outrun me. Or rather, you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun me. Right. Spoiled my own punchline. So, uh, <laughs> um, so that same story, there's much easier way. So that's why hacks, true hacks, are super rare because they're very, very hard. Um, so there, there's that. The, the other thing is it's early days. It takes a while for the technology to be worked out. It hasn't been perfect. It hasn't been without uh, hiccups. Integrations have not been entirely smooth and uh, painless, but it's getting there. Um, it's complex technology. Um, so you've identified four lessons that have been learned over the past year with open banking in the UK. What are some of those? Some of those are, like I said, security. We need to really understand what is in fact a security risk. And security concerns are always going to be there. It, um, could you be hacked? Yes. But like I said in, uh, a minute ago, um, it's not really that great of a problem. The other thing about the uh, overall awareness and adoption. So awareness has been low, but I think that's okay too. You know, you and I, we don't think about internet all that much, but uh, our world runs on internet, but it's sort of faded into obscurity and that's fine. It's the underlying infrastructure that powers everything but uh, we don't have to be aware of the internet as much as we need to be using what's on the internet. Mm -hmm. So by the same token, I think uh, it's when people start using the valuable and cool and innovative stuff that's built using open banking. And by the way, what, what kind of stuff are we talking about? What's important about this innovation? So let's say, um, there's a good example. So Monzo is one of the challenger banks in the UK. Uh, last year, they opened uh, uh, to the public, they offered to the public rather uh, this feature where if you have a gambling problem, you now have the ability to block yourself from making purchases from gambling merchants, online or in person, and you can do it from your app, and then they make it difficult for you to walk back the decision by forcing you to speak to someone in support if you want to uh, mm -hmm. yeah, unlock it, and then they will talk you out of gambling, basically. Um, so in the open banking world, 
I don't have to be a bank to offer you this service. I can just come up with it, and I can integrate with the bank seamlessly, and you'll be using this wonderful service. Um, kudos to Monzo, obviously, but that's the illustration of what, what's enabled. So uh, in terms of awareness and adoption, early days, and awareness is not as important as adoption. Right. So do you think we're ever going to see this in the US? Is this really going to be a transformative initiative like MIFID II, for example, right. has been in Europe? Oh, there's no doubt in my mind, mm -hmm. for sure. Now, it's not going to happen overnight, and right. it's not going to happen for a while, is in my opinion. Um, it is transformative and makes a lot of sense for banks to want to do this. Now, to understand, the regulatory push is the reality in the, in the EU and in the UK. It's not in the US. The US regulatory landscape is much more fragmented. So mm -hmm. in, f for comparison, in the UK, there's two regulators that are administering the program, uh, CMA and FCA. In the US, there's, I think, eight uh, regulatory agencies on the federal level alone that have authority over financial data. And we're not talking about even, you know, even beginning to talk about state level regulators. Right. So it's more complex, but regulation, regulation is coming, but that's not the point. Whether or not it's coming, I think there's good reason for banks to want to move in that direction. Here's why. Platforms are eating the world, basically. Think of Amazon. Amazon went with API strategy a number of years ago. Did them a lot of good. They are arguably one of the most powerful and lucrative technology platforms in the world. They have made technology their business and it's the fastest growing business that Amazon has, right? So if you're a bank, um, another analogy is Apple, right? When Apple launched the iPhone, it launched the iPhone with, with the iOS and some apps on it, but they didn't intend to keep writing all the apps. Right. What they did instead is they opened the App Store and they opened things on the iPhone like its microphone, its camera, its touchscreen, its speakers, its the radio, its Wi-Fi radio, all of those things. They opened it up to developers and then unleashed this creativity uh, onto the world and what we have today is the app economy. So right. we're moving towards API economy and there's a significant sustained advantage to first movers in the space. So I think not only challenger banks but incumbents, uh, well we know that they're paying attention to that. We know cities mm -hmm. doing a lot with open API and you know Capital One is not far behind. So it's going to happen. It makes a lot of sense, regulation or no regulation, but it's not going to happen very quickly. All right, Peter, thank you, as always, for joining us at MarketSite. And thank you for joining me. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.